2013. It's been a while since we met, isn't it? I guess, uh, what was it, November? Or was it October? October. So it's been a while since we've met. Uh, last year. August. It's been a year ago, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's good. We've got some things to uh, present for you today, but before we start, I think there might be a new face or so at the table. So uh, I'm going to let you go around and uh, introduce yourself so that you know we sort of get uh, a feel of who's here. So, Harry, I'm going to start with you. Harry Hips, Pretzel Time. <clears throat> Tom Shell, uh, the Hickory Ham. Steve Ivester. Tony Stafford, PL, Profit Leadership Consultant. Mike Carpenter, who's in the group, formerly Draco, formerly Alcatel. <laughs> what, what's next? I don't know. We knew that. We'd make more money. <laughs> Bill Parrish, North Carolina, Small Business and Technology Development Center. Danny Hearn, Chairman. Busted me. I'm Nathan here at the Top County Economic Belt. Jess Braswell with Accounting for Profit. Jay Adams with Adams Commercial Real Estate Services. Alan Barnhart, Catawba Science Center. Jeff Newville with the CVCC Small Business Center. I'm Shea at Works Consultants. Byron Hicks with the SPTDC, work with Bill. And I'm Terry Bledsoe, I work for Catawba County. A couple of announcements before we get started. Uh, some of you are familiar with uh, TEDx, and last year that uh, there was a TEDx event here in Hickory. Uh, if you haven't got it on your calendars, it's March 23rd. It will be at the soft block again. And right now we're in the process of uh, putting some speakers through a little bit of torment. Um, we have uh, had an a overwhelming response this year for speakers. Um, I guess last year we sort of went out and begged for speakers since it was our first one. Uh, they were good, though. They were all really good. Yeah, they, they were good speakers. Uh, but I think word got out, so we have people that are not just from this area, but uh, from some local, you know, not local universities, but universities that's here in North Carolina, and uh, some people that have some uh, interesting ideas uh, that I think you're going to be, uh, I think you're going to want to hear them. Uh, to tell you a little bit about a process that we went through, last year the speakers, we brought them in uh, like the week before and had them do a little bit of their speech and we talked to them a little bit about how to improve it and so forth and we found that that process uh, was okay but it, it wasn't the process that we felt needed to be for speakers. So Sunday uh, we brought all the speakers in that had applied that could make it and had them do an introduction of themselves and also a, a three minute version of, of their topic. And you would be amazed what three minutes can tell you about people. Uh, First of all, can you condense something down mm -hmm. to three minutes and get your message across just what you, you want? Or do you ramble? Or do you fall apart? Or do you do something great? And from that, we uh, eliminated some speakers and so forth. Uh, we have another uh, uh, speaking time tonight. We had uh, three that absolutely could not make our, our Sunday meeting. And a lot of them is because they're, they're business people and they're on the road. And so uh, we're, we're doing Skype interviews with them tonight. Uh, so uh, after that, we should have our speaking lineup ready to go. And we've assigned, actually, uh, as Jay was asking me a while ago about mentors and so forth, uh, we, we've assigned mentors to them uh, so that uh, we can look at their presentations and, and help them with that. So we're looking uh, forward uh, to March 23rd. And if you can be there, I think you will uh, uh, find some interesting conversations going on. How many of y'all went last year? Well, it's, it's, it is a great event. It could really do something for Hickory, too. You know, we have been really amazed uh, at, at two or three different things about this event. First of all, we're, we're, we're really amazed at how many people in this area had no clue as to what TED and the TEDx talks are about. But then, the other thing that's been really exciting is how many people from outside of our community think it's just great that Hickory was able to pull off a TED event yep. and that we are doing the TED Talks. And especially now that they're saying, okay, they're, they're back again. Uh, so And they don't do one in Charlotte. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they oh, yeah. A, number yeah. Of years ago. a number of years ago. Yeah, yeah. No, it's in this month. 
Oh, is this it? month? Yeah, or next month. I'm not sure what the yeah, date is, but they do have one this year. Oh yeah, I've got all the emails. And, and also, uh, Charlotte is doing a TEDx ED for education. Okay. Um, so I and th that's the first year on on that particular group, and it's interesting. We've only done one, but they came to find out how we pulled the first one off. Hmm. Uh, so uh, TED has some interesting rules. You can't just go out and say you know puts people on the stage and speak. But we have an advantage over Charlotte. We have parking. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's true, and, and I'll tell you, the salt block, uh, if you looked at the videos, that stage and everything, it just looked wonderful on all those videos that come out. Uh, the, the place worked good for us, and uh, it's just a good facility. And Alan, we, have, we appreciate that facility. There. Well, I'm just a tenant over there. So. Well, I know, <laughs> but I tell you, we yeah. appreciate that facility. Terry, the, the thing I found interesting, too, that, that you didn't mention, is how much interesting stuff is going on here. People that are interesting, businesses that are interesting, and I think our general population doesn't know what's happening right here in our own backyard. So for us to be able to think about publicizing that and continue to do you know, those efforts that we have going would be good. And I didn't pay you to lead me into that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I see Danny started to smile whenever uh, you said that. Um, what we're going to do this morning, and, and I apologize, but you're going to get secondhand information. But sometimes secondhand information is, is better than no information, and so forth. Uh, but we've been working on a, a competitiveness plan that is a direct result of this committee. And we've been working with Ted Abernathy from the Southern Growth Policies Board. Well, in November, uh, he did a presentation to uh, that particular group. And then after that, there was some more work that went on. And then he's done a presentation to the county commissioners. And what I wanted to show you this morning was the presentation he did to the county commissioners. And the reason I want to show you that is because uh, a lot of the things that Ted brought up, we've had in our discussions in here. Some of the recommendations Ted has made in there, we've had in our discussions here. So that goes to show that some of our uh, thoughts, our ideas from this group have now come full circle. They did make it to the elected leaders and so forth, and they have seen these things. But there's some interesting statistics that I think you uh, would like to see. And maybe, uh, as, as Alan said, maybe there's some things we've forgotten about our area that are really, really good. And maybe there's some things that we have also maybe put over to the side that we really need to pay attention to. So uh, with that, let me just go through this. Uh, Danny has been in all these discussions. Has anybody else been in those discussions? Uh, yeah, Bill. Uh, so if I leave out any details, which I'm sure I will, uh, please help me and, and pick those up. So one of the things uh, Ted talked about is why is it hard for Catawba County to compete and its cities to compete? And I think all of us knew whenever we came into this committee that there's a lot of the things here that he listed uh, that uh, have changed. And that's what we said from the beginning. There's a lot of factors that have changed. The rules have changed. And, you know, he, he went through this list about the competition being global. The economy has changed tremendously. Location factors have changed. Uh, where people live and where things are manufactured. The talent demands have changed. Uh, customer demands have changed. And the pace of change is probably one of the biggest things that everything is changing so fast that how do you um, how do you compete? And I think you look at it and see that all of those are reasons that it makes us harder to compete today. But he goes back and reminds us that even though these things have changed, things have been changing for quite a while. Uh, you know, they're talking about world markets, and this is back in 1986. The Metropolitan South, just the South in general, uh, started to decline in 1983 
to a certain extent. And then global competition uh, came into this and companies moving places. And he listed these as 15 trends that uh, were changing uh, our world. And as you look at these, the top one up there, urbanization. You know, we've talked about the brain drain here and our younger folks and not being able to keep them in Catawba County. If you go to Charlotte, uh, it was just announced last week that they're going to do another major uh, downtown apartment building. And if you look in, in cities like Charlotte and the major cities, that's what's really being attracted is downtown uh, apartments for young folks to live in. You know, buying a home is no longer the American dream. Uh, we sort of wish it was, but, but it's not. They would rather have an apartment someplace they can work out of and get all the amenities the restaurants, the nightlife, and everything, probably within walking distance. Uh, so this is a huge, huge change that affects us here in Catawba County. And you can go through and, and read all of those. I won't go through all of them. But I think you can see those are trends that are changing the world, uh, especially you go down to specialization, uh, specialization in, in small areas and so forth. Uh, the technology, the speed of the change there, natural resources, whether you have them or whether you don't have them, uh, and, and just intensifying competition everywhere. So, is there anything there that you would disagree with? No, but one that, that I think this group emphasizes and, and has at its core is the one on the bottom right, building resilience into our community. Uh, and, and increasing that, enhancing our ability to embrace, accommodate change, embrace change, whether planned or unplanned. And I think uh, that's a, a huge area there that, that has actually been controversial. Uh, a lot of times you see that come down in the terms of sustainability. And that, that word seems to spark other types of emotions, but uh, if you look, what makes a community where they can be resilient or sustainable when things happen, when the market changes, and, and so forth. Um, so that is a very important one there. Well, I mean, population growth and what is creating that population growth. It isn't, the population growth isn't coming from uh, the European descendants, the the uh, population growth is coming from uh, third world here in the United States. Yeah, that's that's something that's not it's not a new fact to us. Uh, in fact, there was a book called The Browning of America. Some of you probably saw that, but that's uh, well, that was in the nineties, wasn't it? And it was talking about exactly what you're you're saying. Um, well, I mean, the, the socioeconomic principles of the people that are coming from the third world countries, uh, they're, try, it, they're trying to get us to adapt to their principles because they're used to things in their own country that aren't principles of the past in our own country. That may be, but I, that's not what's affecting us here. Not, not at all. Yeah. So. And, and I don't know what it's affecting us here, but what the, the way that Ted would respond to that is, uh, we're not the only ones facing it. That's true. You know, th this is a, an issue that, that's all over. So if, if you look at that, what makes Catawba County different and so forth, uh, I think that's the, that's the question you have to ask when you look at a lot of these trends and so forth. Of course, I just mentioned this a little bit, and Ted emphasizes this, that urbanization, they want to live in urban regions. And one of the discussions that we had um, was uh, Mick brought a plan that, that Hickory had about beautifying uh, some of Hickory, uh, about doing different things in different locations. And one of the questions that was asked, what about downtown? What about living downtown or, or living in areas where people could walk 
to get the services they want. And you know, the, the response was that, yeah, they knew that was uh, what needed to happen. But they needed investors and so forth to take up something like that. Well, the thing with that's codes. Codes kill that, unless you want to build a new building. And then banking <coughs> kills that. So. Well, I'm just saying, that's a question that came directly at them. Uh, because that is a trend, <clears throat> a big trend. I'd be interested in all those right. factors. Which Jay, were... you look like you disagree or something. I, 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 yeah, it's just not that. It's not that simple. Uh, you know, um, my daughter's a senior at NC State, and she reports to me that what her friends want to do is they want to get, they want, they want to go out west, but they do not want to live in Denver. They want to go. They want to have a. They want to live in a smaller community. I mean. If you look at one of the hot spots in the United States, it's Austin, Texas. Well, I mean, it's got a population of something like 800,000, but it's not a megalopolis. I mean, it's it's a it's a city, but it's not it's not like Charlotte. It's half the size of Charlotte, I would say. Um, you know, and I think that there's another population, and I've talked about this before, and I've had people bring this up as a fresh idea on their minds that. You know, people who are in their 50s who finished a career, they don't want to live in an urban area. They want to live in a more rural area. They want to live, they want to wind down. But they're not finished. They're not quitting. And they will take the they will take their experience and the resources that they have and craft them into something they will want to do in their retirement. And they may create jobs for young people. And that's a strategy if you want, if you build on it. Um, so I, that's that's a very simple approach, in my mind, and there are a whole variety of possibilities. Some people do want to live in urban areas. I don't think that Ted was indicating that this is a, a solution or something we want to pursue. Yeah, I, I think we're not going to be that anyway. So I, I, I think he was. Uh, yeah, that was his point. Yeah, that was his point. This is what we're competing against. Yeah. This is a current trend. Right. This is a yeah. current trend that we're competing against. Well, that's a legitimate. That's, that yeah. is true. That, that, uh, Terry, that goes into my question of, of those factors that we all, I think we all can accept are, are factors that affect the environments and, the, and, the, and that we're, we're dealing with. Did he relate Catawba County to those factors? In other words, how, how are we doing with urbanization? Okay, well, let's Plus or minus. You know, let's keep, to, well, first of all, he, he basically said you, you're not going to compete. Not with urbanization. Uh, Maybe that's what I'm, I'm just saying. But there, there was a bunch of different factors up there. Yeah. Well, I'd rather say, how are we going to? Yeah. Well, that's that's our point. If if we know that we're at a, a, a from a one to ten, we're at a one. Do we need to start okay. moving? All right. Well, let's let's, let's go on through the presentation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a very good question. How are we going to compete? We we we're not going to compete with urbanization. Right. We can't. Okay. But there's other other ways we can compete. And. That, that's definitely. Uh, we don't uh, need to worry is. about competing. We need to worry about adapting. Or, or, or like telling that. our story. Sure, what well, let's see what else he had to say here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is some of the background information he, he had up there about the cities and all the <clears> uh, But he also gave us some statistics here about job growth. And if you'll notice the job growth between 1990 and 2000, that was the heyday. It was the good times, and, and jobs were growing. And if you'll notice, he, he compared us to RTP, Wake, Durham, and then the others. Well, there was more growth in those particular areas, but then went to 2000, 2012. And if you'll notice, if you take those three, they account for 99% of the growth. What, what is the blue us? Or just 1% of the growth, excuse the me. Blue the blue is us, area. yes. So we had 1% growth from 1990 to 2000. When it says others, that's all of North Carolina, not just not us. No, that was all of North Carolina. The job growth was only one percent between 2000 and 2012. So, Terry, if you break those numbers down a little bit more, how much of that was government? How much of it was universities? How much of it was uh, new businesses like research? Yeah. I don't have that answer. Because <laughs> Wake and Durham is is huge government in right. universities. Right. And I think if you factor that out, then it would be a little bit more realistic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would wonder how much, uh, 
I'd love to see a chart that shows how much economic incentives went to the various. I don't. Uh, I don't think the education piece of it is is what led to job growth in those areas. I, I could be wrong. I don't think the education piece was what led to job growth. It's RTP. I think, I think it was RTP. Yeah, and and the technical uh, companies that was there because you know if you go all through this, everybody had an economic downturn. But one industry suffered very little, and that was technology. And those particular areas there are heavy in the technology. Anyway, what Ted's point, what Ted's point was here is that, you know, while we're hurting, we're not the only ones. You know, we're, we're not the exception in North Carolina. Danny, if I say something wrong, help me out because they're giving me mean looks. <laughs> he also talked about uh, the counties. There was 18 counties that lost at least 20% of their jobs. I guess you couldn't name one of those. Uh, and he's talking about urbanization here is, 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 is spreading through there. These are the 20, uh, these are the 18 counties that lost at least 20% of the jobs between 2000 and 2011. Does that mean that we lost all our jobs before 2000? No, no. 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 Between, between that period, period. Catawba, okay. between these two, we lost 23 We hit our peak in 2000. Okay. The majority was 2001 and 2008. That's where the, we, there was a trough in between where we fell down and then we caught a level and then we fell down again. It's like a step down process. Terry, the, can you go back one slide? Part of a magnifying effect, no, forward one slide. Part of the magnifying effect to us mm -hmm. uh, in this region was the fact that you've got six contingent counties mm -hmm. yeah, all, all showing up on that. There. So, so those residual economies around we're depressed at the same time, which just really magnifies the, the effect and impact. Right, because the, what I've looked at is, is like the uh, looking at it through the uh, metropolitan areas, the metro areas. There's 13 in the state of North Carolina. It's interesting to me if you kind of go around the Central Carolina uh, uh, Council of Governments region, almost every county that, that abuts Central Carolina. Council of Governments region has, has lost those kinds of jobs, and none of them in Central Carolina have. Well, I think one of the things that Ted was very quick to point out was there, there's urbanization, that trend that was happening. There's globalization in which manufacturing is leaving here because of cheaper labor and other places. And then the economy started tanking on us. And what he was saying is, really, Catawba County just got caught in the perfect storm to cause this economic decline. And I think that's a valid point. And I think we talked about, you know, some of those, but this is a valid point. This was uh, the employed in Catawba County 2008 through the current, and this is, he's got it down by the month. And so you can see uh, from, and I'm not sure exactly when that starts, I guess 2008 in January, month by month, you can see the decline <coughs> and where it bottomed out. and and where it's at, but still there's a long ways to go to get back to where 2008 was. The competition, that was another thing he brought up and I just stated. And the urbanization, you know, we talked about our young folks, it's really hard for us to compete with some of the things that are available in these cities. Of course, he likes the gorilla picture. I'm not sure why. <laughs> they 100 pound gorilla. <laughs> but he also pointed out this that, you know, we've got different countries out there that's offering a labor force that is really, really cheap. Their standards probably don't match our standards as far as the work environment and everything that they have to provide for their employees. So, um, and there's a lot of things that can be done electronically now, services that can be provided by just somebody sitting somewhere. So this is what we're competing against. And he talked 
a little bit about the talent bar here and how work has changed. And basically, he's got a triangle up here that says we have creative work, we have routine work, and basically anything below that line of creative, if it says routine, what can happen to it? Outsourced. Yeah, it can be either outsourced or we can use machines to do it. And so that's where work has really, really changed. And that's, that's what's happened a lot in Catawba County because, you know, we had a lot of hands-on jobs. Especially we had a lot of hands-on jobs in textiles. And if you go into any textile plant now, it's completely automated. So, uh, you know, those can be taken over by machines. Those are jobs that are never going to come back. So you have to look for other types of jobs. I just, I disagree there. You know, you, you, and I keep coming back to industrial clusters, and clusters are sort of areas where you have a, a unique world competence. And to me, your creative workers tie down a region, and that region overlaps into routine and routine outsourced. And the whole idea is to use your creative resource to to to, to envelop and and include a population of people in below that line. And, and uh, I, I'm not sure we always understand that, that our creative people are the really the ones who are going to be the hub of, of our other jobs. And, and you, but the question you know, is, is can you afford to have routine out the <coughs> stuff that you outsource, the stuff you can't afford to keep? Well, but, but uh, uh, it's been pretty well shown that if creativity has to be close to manufacturing or you lose your edge. You can't you can't do your creation here and your and your manufacturing someone else somewhere else and stay on the learning curve. You're going to lose somebody else. Somebody will knock you off the learning curve if you're detached from your production. I would agree with that. I, I mean, I, I from experience, I agree with that. But there's an awful lot of people who are are saying that you can do it through telecommunications. You can yeah, you talk to the furniture designers here, and David Zagarolo David Zagarolo says, "I might have ten years, and then they'll take over what I do." Yeah. yeah, there's a life cycle in, in that early innovation and early production that there's a lot of interaction between design, as you say, it's a good point. Well, and at some point it matures to the level that it's an outsource. It, maybe, but, but Germany and Italy have held on to the machine, man, the, the machine manufacturing segment for, for a long, long time based on their creativity. And it's not just the engineers I mean, and designers say, that are, they're having Italy jobs in making the shows. What? I would say that Italy is in great peril, uh, and you know you're right. Germany has, but it's only. Well, I wasn't talking about countries. I was talking about segments, and particularly the say, say the, the textile machine segment. Okay, well, you mentioned countries. But that's a that's a currency issue too, Italy. Well, there's a it's lot a of things issue. we're talking about and in Germany. It's a subset of the German. Well, I'm just saying, if we're going to think about clusters and clusters where we can have distinct world competence, the, the creative hub is going to be the thing that runs that. Okay, well, let's continue on because some of your discussion is addressed later on. Okay. Okay? Uh, and I, I don't mean to be rude and cut you off because mm -hmm. I, I know the script sometimes can take a big left turn. And, <laughs> okay. and, and it's good most of the time. So, okay. let's, say, let's say right turn. <laughs> this is not political. Okay. Politics. <laughs> As an example, he gave uh, the military and what they're looking for now in, uh, in a soldier. And it says, in the past we wanted men who were physically fit, educated, and disciplined. And now they want someone who wants to belong to a value-based group, who can communicate, who has inquisitive, and has an instinct to collaborate. I don't know what... Uh, I don't know whether this shows a whole lot or not, but it does show that even our military is looking at, uh, at things a little bit differently. Correct. And, you know, we probably are going to have to look at our workforce a little bit differently, too. He brought up this, that these are the most valuable skills for job candidates, and you can see communication skills, that's been important for a long time. Strong work ethic, we've talked about that before. Teamwork skills, initiative, interpersonal skills, problem solving skills, analytical skills, flexibility and adaptability. And that one is sort of a new one that's come into uh, the job skills uh, in the last little while. And I think that's because you look at uh, the average teenager now, they're going to have how many jobs in a lifetime? Or how many careers? 
it's like 10 or 12 different ones. Uh, so you have to be able to adapt, especially the way jobs and all are changing and computer skills. You carry that number eight at the human level, at the individual level, is a perfect corollary to the resiliency at the community level and the ability to change. And in some cases, rapidly. Here we've lost uh, those jobs in the space of 14, 12, 10, 12, 14 years. And that's a huge change and impact to a, a sudden shock to a community. So that's, uh, uh, what was it, um, uh, uh, Darwin said, in, uh, in, in, humans, in species, it's not the most intelligent nor the strongest that survive, but the most adaptable. And I think if you look at our workforce, they may have had a little more trouble adapting because they have been so ingrained for generations uh, in, in furniture and textiles and, and some of the other jobs okay. that we have here. But you know, the thing is, our, our cultural uh, affinity towards entrepreneurialism, how does that, how does that fit with the flexibility, adaptability, because entrepreneurialism would seem to me to be closely linked to those abilities. It's a perfect overlay. That's what I'm mm -hmm. thinking. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very good question. I, I, I don't know that I have any kind of response to it, but I think it's a very good question. I think it's interesting that those things, though, as strong as they are, aren't what's being outsourced. So if we're losing jobs, but yet those are the important things, where's the connection there? Well, I think that's why he has it up here. You know, if we look at jobs and so forth in America, that these are, are the most important things. Mm -hmm. those, those that yeah. are in the routine are the ones that are being outsourced. Okay. Anything that's in that routine category, basically you can, you can outsource or mechanize. With number two up there is one of my key points, and but I think a lot of people I talk to will tell you that they feel that strong worth ethics were a thing of the past, mm -hmm. that we're not teaching work ethics today of, in our in our students and our children, and and so it is a problem. And so if you don't have strong work ethics, you know they're they're not there to support the employer, to be honest with the employer, to be honest with the day's work. And I think it's a huge problem in our entire society here in the United States. Yeah, that is correct. Yeah, I believe that, but it, but it is a local phenomenon. I mean, that's, no, that's no, not a it, local it's phenomenon. Not. Thing. You know, you, you know when I look at that list, i got a 16-year-old son, and I look at that list and I think about the things that he has and the things he doesn't have. And, and he, I mean, Eagle Scout at 15, so strong work ethic, teamwork skills, all that stuff. His biggest weakness and I think this is true for his generation, is communication skills. Sure, they are so used to that. They are so used to texting, and texting is the lowest form of communication. And that's their primary form of, of communication. And, and, you know, I think that that's a very interesting list to me. Communication skills is number nine. I mean, that's reading changed. skills. Yeah. Computer skills is number nine. Reading skills is <laughs> number nine for you. <laughs> <laughs> computer skills? Computer skills. Computer skills. That's yeah. Communication is one. Communication is <laughs> one. I mean, and that's uh, that's the thing that I think they face is that they have not developed what skills about interpersonal communications. <laughs> OMG. <laughs> but in 2015, they're going to be the biggest segment of the workforce. So, get ready. Who has to do the adapting? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> but communication skills are essential. They are for for for, for business. Common. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So this is where Ted starts making some suggestions. There, that you know, we've had a, a time of rapid changes, and, and many of the advantages we had here in. Uh, Catawba County are, are maybe now obsolete. So it's time to make major adjustments and he's talking about a reset of language, leadership, and approach. Amen. So he had had three areas 
and Danny, I may have to ask you to help me a little bit on these three areas. He, he talked about product development, marketing, branding, and, and client management. Uh, you know, first the product development. Uh, and Nathan might uh, can say a few words here too about what product we have. The marketing and branding uh, is one area that he felt was, was very, very weak in that uh, what is our message? And I think we've said the other that in here before, you know, how do you associate this area? What, what are we good for and so forth? And how is it being marketed out there? And the client management. Danny, can you help me a little bit on that one? I, you know, I, 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 I haven't seen that one. I don't think that came up. Was uh, that existing think, client or potential yeah, client? Betty and I, think. I think he's talking about really uh, our, our leadership and so forth and, and internal clients. But let's go on and, and take a look at some of the things he's got here. He said that we needed to address three major issues here. And the first one was uh, the buildings and sites. And he says if you don't have product, there's no way you can attract business. And I think that was something that Scott came up uh, early on, uh, well, two or three years ago, wasn't it? that was after Apple come in, that he really didn't have a, a huge area that uh, he could market. And so if you don't have uh, the, the, the product that they want, then you're at a distinct disadvantage. And one of the things that's coming up in this is actually the the sizes of the buildings and so forth, that we have a lot of buildings available, but they don't meet today's manufacturing standards. So he said that's one way uh, of looking at it that we have to uh, go into this. And, and I think there has been a partnership now with some of the municipalities and the county for some land to start developing here. The skilled labor, and he mentioned about we need to start with a, a clear understanding of what we need as far as skilled labor. And brought up about uh, the educational attainment. That is going to be a problem for us until uh, that comes off of there, even though we're talking about 25 plus uh, year olds. If we don't have what the market wants, then we're at a disadvantage. And the communication infrastructure. And that one. Uh, you know, he's talking about uh, the ability to connect to the internet and communicate with the world. And, you know, those are three big uh, areas that uh, you have to have to attract business. Terry, I, I like his use of the word anti there because they are, it's not that you, if you don't have those, you will lose out to other cities and counties and regions. You're not even in the pot. Right. You're not even considered, you're not in the game. Would you... Would that be right from, from EDC's perspective in terms of recruitment? The price of the yeah, that's, that's the... Well, I, I put up uh, gigabyte files on the internet all the time anymore, and it's taken me four hours to do that. And a gigabyte is nothing anymore. But when we say these are the things that get you into the game, are there other games? Well, our big, our big employers are, are let's just say, Surete, Hickory Springs, Corning, which came out of Superior, MDI. Uh, all those were homegrown. Right. You know, when you talk about client management, right. well, the guy that's going to grow the, that's going to grow the new, new Superior Cable is one of your clients, but he can't get funded in Catawba County. That's right. But we have the resources for the communication <clears throat> infrastructure right there, and we're not putting those pieces of the puzzle together. And that would be one of the easiest things to do if we can get them on board. Let's go on and take a look at what else he's got. These are the other antis that he said uh, you have to have to get in there. Highway accessibility, and he gave us a good rating on that one. Yeah. Uh, should, at least. Uh, water and sewer, some other basic dimensions. Uh, it's the competitive cost of power, and he said... We do have a, a cheap cost of power here, so that is a competitive uh, advantage. The cost of doing business uh, is, is one of the ones that, you know, it's cheaper to do business here in a lot of other areas. The health care and affordable housing, that we do pretty well in those. Mm -hmm. 
He didn't talk about quality of life. Well, they're kind of combined to create that, don't they? Or I mean, in that in that previous one, I mean, he didn't talk about the. No, all, I, I all think the, that's frequently left out. You know, with me, that's the reason the nest builder comes here is because of quality of life. Our libraries, and our symphonies, and our science museums, and our art museums, mm -hmm. and our choral society. That's those are the things that make that distinguish us from. From Charlotte, is that these things are here and that they're available. They don't mention them outdoor resources. That was not one he mentioned. They were they were discussed and they have been discussed. One of the reasons that it's not here is so difficult to capture what is quality of life to yeah, exactly. of life to me are as many golf courses as you can cram into a county. Well, it, you know, the thing about it is, and I'm just going to put a finer point on that, if you've got so much, if you've got so much population that you can't play golf on those golf courses, it, it defeats itself. We've got golf courses, and you don't have to go get a tee time mm -hmm. for the most part. But my point was not golf courses. My point is that, that it's so ephemeral and, and hard to, to define. But it's but you could talk about it for a long time. And, and but, Bill, we need to quantify that. We need to, that's one of our assets. And so you don't leave it off the list if it's one of our assets. I mean, well, that's, that, you well, that's a demand-based issue, too. Okay, let, let me, are you going to create uh, the Nathan, demand? Nathan, I'm going to put you on a spot for a second. Can you create the demand? Apple and Target was two of the biggest ones we brought here in a long time. Mm -hmm. Was quality of life mm -hmm. on their list? Been discussed. Um, Apple, no, probably not at all. Um, target, I wasn't here during that period, but I would suspect probably on the very low end. How about not to say it's not hugely important. Yeah, how, how about after they got here? It, it, uh, it really matters in terms of if people are moving here. Okay. But remember, this, this is Scott's list. If this is the Chambers list, it's all there. Mm -hmm. This is strictly economic. And Apple did come by the salt block, and they toured the salt block. I don't know if that was it would probably after that. Well, my point, my point is quality of life is one of those things that's important to them. But whenever you look at the big things, Apple's big thing was power and, and broadband connectivity and probably cheap land, too. You know, you have to look at what, what really brought them to that area. I, I've not been in these discussions, but I know quality of life has been a huge component of this. The, just, you know, on the outside, I, I gather enough information. I know it's been a huge part, so I, I'm not sure why it's not included. Um, and this, maybe it's kind of what you're getting at. But it's, it's not been left out by any means, I don't think. Especially for that younger demographic that, I mean, they cited one of the biggest issues to come out is the 18 to 35, 40-year-old demographic and that, you know, the, the flight of those kids. Mm -hmm. um, and the whole discussion has revolved around quality of life in a lot of respects for that. So I don't, I don't want you to think it's, it's been left out, and I'm not sure exactly. why it's not it hasn't included. been left out. Okay. Terry, well, I get the sense that this is a list of issues yeah, is that something. companies consider in making their decisions. It's not necessarily the way we want to offer ourselves up. Right. Well, we need to play on our Well, I, I suspect that's coming. Yeah. Okay. Well, but go back to what Bill said a while ago. Before they even set foot in Catawba County, they're going to look at a lot of this stuff. Correct. And if you don't measure up on this, it doesn't matter about quality of life. Correct. Going back, I want to make this point and I'm going to shut up. Going back in time, <laughs> if, you could have, if you were to have recruited, if you could have recruited an Apple data center or Steve Jobs, which would you have picked? I just want you to think like that. That's, that's our strength is we may be attractive to an important person, getting back to what you said, who will create a homegrown industry. Don't lose sight of that. That's all I'm saying. Those creative people are the hub of clusters. And clusters are the, are the key to international confidence. Well, I was at, 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 at the EDC office a week ago Friday with Abernathy, and one of the stories, or one of our largest industries brought a, a a recruitment or a lady being recruited as an engineer for their company. She came and interviewed, stayed here a weekend, and they called her Monday and said, she, She's not coming, she didn't like, she didn't like Hickory Talk. Mm. 
It happens. Did you must have met with her, Dan. Well, I'm going to talk about that. You didn't have much to say there. It's very important when somebody like that comes here that they, that they are guided through their visit here, not just left to, to float in the wind. It's real important that you make that, that, uh, that visit as, as positive as possible. And they should be meeting with people on the Science Museum Board and the Museum of Art Board and the Symphony Board. They should be knowing that, they, that, that power is accessible to them. And, and Jay, to your point right there, that was one of the things that came up in some of the discussions, that when we have people in here that is considered investments, we need to make sure that they know the positives, the good stories, and the good areas and so forth, that all the, all the things that we have here that make life so good in the Hickory area. Uh, and, and sometimes we don't do a very good job of that. Well, I'll tell you, one experience, doing Mellow Mushroom, we had people come in to look at Hickory on a day like today. And my wife, Donna, is very good at this. And she took them to EDC. She took them there first to give them information. And then we had to actually look at sites on a miserable day like this. But by the end of the day, the guy said, we're coming here. I like this town. It feels good. And it was because of the way she, I think, had choreographed the visit. Mm -hmm. I think that's very important. She's hired. Then. This, this well, is just he, some more. I didn't thought people agree. like her. Th this is just some more statistics that Ted brought out uh, about what matters most in site selection. Uh, and he did point out, you know, that there's taxing and incentives and so forth. But uh, ease of permitting there is one of the things that's in there that um, mm -hmm. we need to look at. The, the mm -hmm. all all these different things make it attractive or unattractive, depending on how we approach it, to who comes here. And this was just percent of site selection factors ratings as, as very important. Of course, highway accessibility, we do good there. Labor costs, we do there, good there. Availability of skilled labor, we may do good there. Depends on what the kind industry is. But for the most part, we probably don't do very well there. Uh, you, know, you can see the other things there that are very important to us. And I don't have all of these because this is a PowerPoint and didn't the rest of his targets there, but what are the opportunities? One of the things he said was that we need to target manufacturing. Did he say that because we have been a manufacturing area or we need to try to re re give rebirth to manufacturing. He says that we are a manufacturing area and we need a reset as okay. to how we approach uh, manufacturing. But uh, if you look up there by industry and, and so forth, and this is North Carolina and the South, uh, you'll notice that uh, North Carolina is very high in manufacturing and the financial uh, industry. And here's the employment uh, changes by sector. And you see, this is what really hurt us. Manufacturing changes were way down there, in which education, health care, and so forth were still up there. And among all those industries, manufacturing has a far greater multiplier effect. Oh, absolutely. So mm -hmm. It I, creates value. You take you raw, raw materials mm -hmm. and you create something out of that where the service industry, all you're doing is trading stuff. Mm -hmm. And that includes construction. Well, that's another discussion we need to have sometime, the difference between value creation and value capture. Because uh, one of them leads to a future, the other one leads to a dead end. And uh, we need to look at that. Anyway, uh, if you look at the statistics and so forth, uh, the manufacturing specialization index that he has up here, Hickory has more manufacturing as far as furniture is concerned than any other place in North and South Carolina? Well, I always remember when I was a kid and you watched The Price is Right, mm -hmm. and most of that furniture on those <laughs> showcase showdowns was stuff, and it said hickory, 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 all the time. <laughs> and they weren't talking about hickory wood, they were talking about hickory, North Carolina. Well, and, and there's, I went to Seattle uh, last year, 
about a year and a half ago. And, and I walked out of the hotel and they got this nice bridge that goes across into a, a mall. And as soon as I walked into the mall, there was a furniture company there, or a furniture sales company. Basically, every name that you saw on that uh, wall up there was right here. Yeah, because it was high-end furniture and this was a high-end mall. Uh, to be honest with you, I could not afford to buy a chair in there at all. <laughs> the prices they were selling. Well, that, that was a shock, Jay, because I, I'm used to walking in and seeing our prices here from the same companies, and you look out there, and I, I just saw this chair, you know. And, but my point is, high-end furniture, there is a trend that Ted didn't talk about, but it's the trend that China now has a lot more money than they've ever had before. They don't want the Chinese product. They want American-made product, and they want high quality. So think of how much furniture they use. And, and that might be one of the resets that, that Ted is talking about. I, I watched that. this thing last night, and it was the, the six uh, inheritors of Walmart. Mm -hmm. the, the, they have more wealth than 30% of this country. Their total wealth is 30% of this nation. Uh, Terry, you, you yes. talk, use the word reset. Uh, one of uh, his clients, furniture manufacturer, old traditional uh, uh, line furniture, his largest customer and largest single orders are not coming from the U.S., coming from Russia. That's right here. Baker Furniture just did a million dollar contract with China, or a company in China. So I think that's one of the things that Ted was talking about when he's talking about resets. Uh, electrical equipment, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to find, okay, this area, what are we known for? So we are still known for the furniture, but we're also, if you look at the electrical equipment and appliances and so forth, the biggest here. Of course, that's coming from our cable industry. So, but well, well, you know, in, in, in electrical equipment, until 1992, we were the biggest hub in, the, in, in electrical equipment distribution, and that was because of GE and its supplier network. And, and, and we had a real cluster here, a significant cluster, with thousands of workers in, in just this, electrical equipment. And, and when GE disappeared, that, that, that cluster is still here, but it's, it's, sort, of, it's sort of sinking into the, into the swamp. But, but, you know, it was ours. It wasn't Charlotte. It was Hickory's. And I, was, I visited Charlotte Regional Partnership when I was in Charlotte this summer. And, and I said, you know, we're talking about clusters. We're talking about rural confidence. I said, well, well, Hickory can be a node on one of our clusters. And I thought, well, screw you. They talk about, they talk about power in Charlotte. But until 1992, we were the cluster in, in power distribution in, in the southeast. And we need to get it back. Well, th this is just some information that Ted gave us just to so you can get a set here as to, you know, what are we still good at and uh, what are we still known for. This is manufacturing jobs by pay, and if you can see Hickory Lenore, uh, our manufacturing share of all jobs in 2010 was 25.3%, which is high if you look at the other. In fact, it's the highest uh, in all of these areas. Our, uh, annual wages for all jobs is 33, and the annual, annual wages for manufacturing is 36. And if you look at manufacturing all the way down through there, we do have the lowest uh, annual wages for manufacturing. Well, that's and that's a component or, or a byproduct mm -hmm. of what we are manufacturing. Exactly. Yeah, look at the multiple of your average annual to the manufacturing, and ours is barely above that. And then you go to the next line, and you go basically to about one and a half times the average annual versus the manufacturing wage, and you go down and you see all that. You know, instrumentation for aviation, instrumentation, uh, medical devices, th th those are high, much higher paying manufacturing jobs. So we don't want to increase our, sh our percentage, we want to increase our average wage. Mm -hmm. We want to change what we're manufacturing. Mm -hmm. And that's the reset Ted's talking mm -hmm. about. Yeah. We're good at manufacturing, we need to stay in manufacturing, but we need to maybe reset what we manufacture, the type of manufacturing that we're bringing in. But the difference between commodity manufacturing and specialized manufacturing are these hubs of creative people. 
they create agree, yeah, these yeah. distinct yeah. industries that have that have unique competence, mm -hmm. both in themselves and the labor force around them. So Jay, you can see the next slide. Yep. It's exactly what you said. But that, that requires that we work on the skills of the workers and so forth. And the hard part there is to know what kind of skills that we need to work on. Well, you know, I'll, I'm just kind of throwing this out. I, I worked at, at c in 1983 when they were bringing in huge numbers of PhDs, master's degrees. I mean, people coming from all over. They just brought them all in. Um, and it was, it was a dramatic time, and there was a lot of pushback, too, from the existing industry because they were afraid that it was going to raise them I mean, it was going to raise the cost of labor. It was going to do all have all kinds of dramatic effects on the furniture industry. But um, it'd be interesting to talk to some of the people that came here. A lot left in the late '80s. A lot of them did leave when we had our first downturn. But some of those people that came here knew particularly like Hickory because they were young people out of college. You might are you one of them? No. Uh, uh, they. Uh, that they stayed. Like, some of them left and came back because they mm -hmm. realized what Hickory was. That's a good conversation to have because I've had it a number of times. I'm one of the few people that grew up, I actually grew up in the States, but I'm, I'm one of the few people around. Everybody went to school that moved away. And um, yeah, I, just, <laughs> I managed to keep making a living in this area and traveling everywhere else. And, um, yeah, the, 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 the brain draination is, is very real and it's. Um, it's compelling. <clears throat> Terry, we recently had, let's say we, the city, uh, recently had, I think, about 28 or 30, 32 uh, college students from all over North Carolina, some outside North Carolina, mostly within North Carolina. And we, we gathered them at the salt block and spent probably two hours with them. And one of the first questions that we had, and Alan Jackson did a wonderful job of facilitating, one of the first questions that we asked were, and these were all students, they were college students or recent graduates, that had grown up here. And the question was, raise your hand if you are planning or envision yourself moving to this area after graduation. How many hands went up? Two. Maybe one. No, we had a couple. We had a couple of hands that went up out of 30 or so. And, and, and then we began to dig down and, and ply and pry and, and see why, why not and all those things. But that, for me, was a surprisingly small number. Of, um, but they go where the interest, the, 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 the old nightlife came up to, the jobs, of course. You've got to have good jobs. But two out of 30? I, I have people that I work with, the main people that I work with are like entry level people and, and a lot of them are college graduates and since there aren't any jobs in here they're working in the restaurant business. But uh, one of my friends is $58,000 in debt after going to, to Lenore Ryan. It's going to be hard to pay that off working in the restaurant business. Well, well you know, uh, we talk about these creative hubs and in most cities, say in Boston or Silicon Valley, or reach RTP. When there's a recession, the engineers get spun off. Half of them say, I like it here. I'm going to start a business here. But if you look at what happened after World Trade when, when Telcom crashed and all those people came crawling out of Secor, ideally about a third of them would have said, we like your crew. We'll stay here. We'll start a business. But they didn't. They all left. And I think that's, that's something we need not, to change. Not all of them. Not all of them. And, and the thing is, all it takes is one or two to be meaningful. You're not going to get. You're not going to get a large fraction. You're. I want to just tie one thing to Terry. You know, you're going to have the TED event here, and and that's you're going to bring some people in from other parts of the state to be. Don't miss the opportunity to show those people the best side of Hickory. Those people that come in as guests for the event, don't let them come in and go to the auditorium and do their thing and leave. Do something else. Well, we have several things planned with them that week before. That's a different <laughs> Maximize that opportunity. So. Just don't let them drive around town. Yeah. <laughs> don't tap them on the south side of the track. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nobody cares about that. Don't let them drive. 
<laughs> Don't give them corrections. <laughs> okay, th this was some of the competitive drivers uh, that Ted brought up about global manufacturing. So if we're going to stay in manufacturing, we're going to have to look at what the drivers are. And, and of course, the number one he mentioned up there was talent-driven innovation. It goes back to that creativity you're talking about and so forth. Then you start getting the cost of labor and energy costs and, and things like that. Um, I still don't see the quality of life, but the quality and availability of health care uh, showed up on this particular list. And keep in mind, he's pulling these lists. You can see this one came from uh, Deloitte. So, you know, he's just pulling standard stuff off the market out here to show you what uh, these things are. But I think the one where we really fall down is that number nine, local business dynamic. I mean, it's, we're still in, in an era where if your daddy or granddad didn't own a furniture factory, then you don't exist. And, and whether you still have a furniture factory or not. And I think our local business dynamic just stinks, mm -hmm. both in funding and in, in sort of the power structure around business dynamics. Local business, small business dynamic. Even large. Uh, I know that's that. Uh, that could be. And this is where he's listed as to where are our future opportunities to, uh, that target the manufacturing and, and maybe do, uh, looking at some of what you said there uh, a moment ago, the higher manufacturing jobs where we pay more, uh, the data centers that uh, said we need to do a reset set on that. And I forget what he meant by reset on the data centers. One thing about data centers is we have the power. We have, the, we have a lot of the pieces. And this is something that... David Pace and I talked about at length. We also have the construction assets. We have all the stuff to build data centers. And, and that's, that's an area that we, we kind of talked about. Uh, but data centers, I mean, how many employees do they have? Yeah. No. No. And, and, and how much do they spin off? And, all yeah, how much, and what are the support <coughs> things? That, nothing? That's all we need Building, is support. And they're plug and play. Just, they're done. But then again, if you look at manufacturing in general, go back to that from data centers, the number of jobs they have today compared to the number of jobs they had just 10 years ago is probably less than 50% because of all the automation and so right, forth in right, the manufacturing. Right. So, I mean, any of these that you go after, we're not talking about hundreds and hundreds of employees. But we'll probably be talking about jobs that pay significantly better. And have a big impact on the local economy because of yeah. their supply base. Yeah. Potential, yes. So we become an enclave of high paying jobs. I, I like I like the cluster words. See? Yeah, it is a good word. Really but good. but that cluster is around a creative nucleus. Yeah. And he also talked about energy and our connection. Uh, with Charlotte and so forth, and you know, maybe we need to reset what we're looking at there. Basically, he said, you know, we need to get out of that box. He talked a little bit about the inflow of money uh, in Catawba County, and, and basically, these are the areas that we have inflow of money from. I think you probably all agree that those are all in there, you know, so how do we capitalize on it? There was a big reset about marketing branding. <clears throat> what Ted said was that when he talked to people here, that we all have a very good story to tell. You know, we've got a heritage of manufacturing. We have a lot of manufacturing going on here. You know, we haven't lost all our manufacturing by any stroke. We've got a lot of good resources, you know, the cheap power, the, the uh, highway structure that we have here and so forth. But he said every time he talked to somebody, the first thing that came out was about all the job losses, that every story started with a negative. And he said one of the first things we're going to have to reset is the stories that we tell, that we need to start telling about the positive things here, and we need to start emphasizing the positive things here, and not dwell on the negatives. Is it 
most everybody has these same negatives. We may have got hit harder, but there's no reason to dwell on the negatives. One of the interesting exercises that he did was to pose the question to those in the room. Uh, uh, you're talking, you're speaking with someone who's never been here. They don't even know about North Carolina. How do you describe Hickory to them? How do you describe where you live to them? Not asking for answers, but just a just an interesting. Uh, each of us would describe it in a different way. I I generally say I live close to Jay. <laughs> <laughs> I generally, if I'm talking to one of my gearhead buddies, I say I drive straight drive cars in Hickory, and it's no problem. <laughs> I do that in Charlotte or Raleigh. <laughs> but it's a, that's a that's an important question, and, and how we that's as an individual, and then how we describe it as a, as a chamber, as a community, as even within clusters. What are our clusters? Yeah, one, of, one of the terms that I hear from site selectors, and I've heard this from a number of them over the years. But it's still true. The people who come, that they're going to try, they're going to put something in Hickory, or they're thinking about Hickory. After spending time here, they'll say this place feels great. Mm -hmm. That is common as it can be. Yeah. Yeah. And they go, they walk through retail stores, they go through Union <laughs> Square, they go wherever they go, uh, and uh, they, it, it, as long as they're not driving. <laughs> they, 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 they love the feel of Hickory, and, and, and it's true. Now, Hickory needs to do something. That, that's, that, that, that is a thing you get a lot of pushback on. I think the biggest thing that we're fighting is perception. Reality, I think we can all look at for you know good yeah. pockets of good things, but it's the perception, and that's the, uh, the hardest thing to change, is people's perception of this thing. And we talked about this two and a half years ago when I first came here. Yep. You know, it is the perception of when you say, what do you think about Hickory? And the perception is it's a dead town. It's lost all its matter. In fact, as you say, it, you got more negative things to say about it than you do positive things. Right. But sometimes, you know, the good is lost in the noise at the bottom. Yeah. I, I want to talk about Dan Goss, who's one of the leaders in TEDx. He's a kid who moved here. He worked, worked in high-level uh, computer uh, sales out of Boston, moved here for family reasons. He's building a product that, that uh, monitors and manages chicken houses using the cell phone network, which apparently is a very distinct technology and, and capability. I was talking with him last night. I said, you know, there's a big poultry show in, in, in Atlanta. He said, I've got, a, I've got a major booth there. And he's developed this all over the last two years here in Hickory. And it's just, I mean, uh, I, I know that Bill knows about it, but nobody else here knew, knew about that. But that's the kind of thing, that's where, that's where it's at. You know that, and it's like, it gets lost in the signal. He can't. He, he struggled, struggled. Finally, got a little angel investing. Cause I think basically yeah. out of his family, someone else that came here with that same sort of lost in the noise wouldn't have gotten any investing in Hickory. Right. But we, that's the positive. That's oh, the, no, that's, and, there, and there actually is plenty of positive going on. There's no doubt about it. Right. But you got to fight is, the perception. Well. It, Ted mentioned about how he got information and so forth. He gets a lot of information from me. I retweet a lot of the information that comes here. But for the last two years, I've made the personal commitment. I only retweet the good stuff. Right. You know? So if it comes out that you know we have an unemployment rate that went up, I don't retweet it. Now, I don't know whether that's not being truthful with people out there or not. They're your tweets. Yeah. They're my tweets. So I send out the positive things. You know, something comes up that we we get we're getting 25 more jobs over here. That's retweeted. Unemployment went up because a bunch of people moved in here and they're looking for work. Well, <laughs> I don't I don't I don't spin it that way. But but other things like you know uh, the uh, Murray's Mill Festival and so forth. Like, why are we telling people about those? Those are good events. The events that take place in Uptown Hickory, they're good events. Hard Square. Part Square, yeah. I mean, that's that's a unique event that nobody's going to find anywhere else. But if if we tell that positive story, then and and make that commitment to tell positive stories, at, at sooner or later, it the negative goes away. You mentioned about the positive was at the bottom. It should be at the top. Of course. Well, the thing that Hickory can do is, is kind of position itself as a cool place. Uh, you know, it's not an urban area. It, it but it but. It, if you can't, if you're not going to be able to compete in that realm, then be something else. Don't compete where you can't compete. 
Yeah. Be be something unique. A differentiated and, alternative. Yeah, thing. right. That's mm -hmm. right. And you know the thing that I have, and I have, I have to sell hickory every day, and so I have to come up with positives. I mean, people generally know that we've been clobbered as far as underperforming goes, but you know one of the things I say to people is if you, if, and I say hickory broadly because I'm, it's the whole area. If you live in Conover right now, you're you're 35 minutes from 485. I mean, you're less than an hour from trade and trial. Why do you want to deal with the trauma that it takes to live in, in Charlotte? I grew up in Concord, and it, from Conover to trade and trial, it's about the same as it is from Concord. Because you don't have the capacity in the, in the transportation <coughs> infrastructure between Concord and trade and trial that you do from here. So there's a lot of good stuff about this area. I mean, there really is. Uh, I've gotten into some interesting arguments on Facebook about it recently. <laughs> but anyway, he, he was, uh, again, bringing us out about uh, <clears throat> the positive stories and, and how the negative just perpetuates a lot of things. Sure. And, and it's true. Uh, I, I mentioned to our, our commissioners, and I hope I don't step on anybody's toes in here, but entering Hickory, for the longest time, it may still be up. We had a, a real estate sign up that uh, bragged about how many foreclosures they had for sale. Now I know they were trying to sell them, but if you come into Hickory and right off a of major interstate and see that, what does it tell you about the area? Well, it's a lack of positive focal points. I mean, you know, it's like I say, the bad news gets trumpeted everywhere. Where where are the focal points going to be to tell the good stories? That's it's at it doesn't appear to be, you know, through local media, and I mean, we've got to find an outlet for those. Well, one of the things, getting back to that, one of the worst billboards for Hickory is the, the failed development on the Highway 321 corridor. Because people who, who realize, uh, when they see a, uh, Eckerd's that's brand new and closed, oh, oh. Uh, when they see a big restaurant that looks to be new and it's closed, on a major thoroughfare like that, they, they can't resolve why, 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 why. You got two restaurants. Two, yeah, I know you're talking. I know there's more. There's more than one, but there is an explanation for it. But you're not going to see. I, I, and I've, I've articulated this, but Hickory's not going to do anything about it. You, I mean, that's the problem. With Hickory is in It's just inactivity, failure to to address problems. If you explored why Key West Fish House closed in the first place, I knew all you'd be at the you'd be at the nut of the problem. When I was when I went out on the porch, the, uh, the grand opening, and they served us a great meal. I'm sitting there with uh, with a friend of mine uh, who's in the telecommunications business, and uh, he said, "This is a great place. I'm gonna come here all the time." I said, "Not for long," and he said, "What? Why?" And I said, six months, at the best." And he said, what are you talking about? The food's great. The view's great. And I said, they never worked out access to the lake. The access is poor to the, to the driveway. There's no retail mass here. I mean, and I went down the list, and he said, oh, you're crazy. Well, it's not hard to see. I mean, when they were doing the, the zoning for the, the Eckerds, I said, these people are insane to do this. Insane. Okay, this is uh, his suggestions on the branding there. And notice that first one, proud and celebrating our past. We have a strong past, we have a positive story there, and we should be future focused with that and celebrating it. Manufacturing is where we came from. Uh, it should be positive, and then the next one is talking about, here it is, talking about the innovative companies. That's what we should be targeting as we come in here. Um, the first place in North Carolina, too, and we need to answer that question. Right now, it's furniture and it's electronics and so forth. We are first. But it says we've got to be intentional about it, we've got to be excited about it, and we've got to be aggressive about it. And, uh, you know, some of the efforts that we've tried in the past to communicate and work together have just fell all to pieces. So we've got, uh, we've got a job there. Danny, you want to say anything else about those? Any? I think if you are selling around a creative core, you're selling like a commodity. 
you know, and, and, and you have to you have to attract that creative core, and you have to you have to nourish that creative core with funding, and and otherwise you're selling commodities. I I, I have problems with the whole EDC idea because it, it doesn't focus on that creative core that builds. That yeah, builds strength. It's important what it does. <clears throat> it, it is, but I I. I I'm more tuned to finding those people, those individual people, that if you could attract them here, they would be the nucleus of something bigger. And I, I can't get away from that. It's people. It's, uh, it's the Charles Lindberghs of the world that, that change things. It really and change that's long term things. growth. Yeah. That comes with that. Yeah. Okay, notice, notice what he said about where do we start with all this? <coughs> where do we brand that? He's basically saying we have an internal problem first, mm -hmm. then we have an external problem that we need to start and market to our own citizens here. And he talked about parents. He said parents have a tremendous influence. You know, you've got kids leaving and so forth, but a lot of times it's the parents tell them that there's no opportunities here. And if the parents tell them that, you know, that's the first line. Uh, so we need to make sure that everybody in Catawba County and this region feels like that, uh, you know, this is a good place to live. And they're convinced of it. So that's where your story starts. To the existing businesses out there, uh, and you start talking about brand and so forth and your supply chain, and then you move out to your neighbors that's around you and, and send out things about good things that's happening here. You know, all three of those are, are within driving distance for us for day events and so forth. We should be marketing aggressively to them. And then once you get to that point, you start talking about national and international targets. But you've got to start internal and work out. Because if, if we don't market to that first group up there and somebody comes in and tells them a negative story, then we've lost anybody that starts down at the bottom. Exactly the same thing Jay's saying. When you bring somebody in, that first person up there is going to make the difference to the last one down there. You know, some people have to be entertained. And, yeah. some pe and some people entertain themselves. We need to draw people who entertain themselves. We don't need to, I mean, we're just not gonna win if it's a person who needs to be entertained, have a bar to go to, or have concerts to go to constantly, just a smorgasbord of things to do. We need to be those people who are more self-contained, people who, I mean, that's, a, that's the kind of person but, who's gonna enjoy but, I mean. Uh, are, are we going to aggressively work on these areas of town that are falling apart so that we don't have to focus on, well, let's take them there and there, but make sure you don't take them over there. What are you talking about? I'm talking about the south side of the tracks over here in Hickory. I mean, that's where people are riding around to and then seeing that on their own and saying, I'm not coming here. That is the downright fact of it. I mean, well, I have uh, talked but, but, to it, all That people. stuff is going to take time to cure, and that's all there is. But are we going to get aggressive about it? Well, are you saying through what mechanism? I'm saying about <laughs> focus. Through what mechanism? Are you talking about government doing it? Forget it. Uh, Forget it. Okay. There's got to be policies. Listen, policies are important. I want, I want to tell you something I saw the other day that really got my attention. I got to walk through the holler hunter mill that's being redeveloped over at the railroad tracks. And you know, it's neat to drive by at night and see all the lights in there. It really is cool looking from the outside. It's a beautiful outside. building at night. But when you, huh? It's beautiful at night. But when you go in the building, wait till you see the view out of it. And one of the view. <laughs> Yeah. What, what's your point? I mean, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not it, it really is cool. It's very cool. But one of the things is Hickory Manufacturing is sitting over there, and and you know we were we were kind of looking at that, and somebody said that wonder what will happen to that, and I said you know if that manufacturing building was lighted at night, it would be the coolest looking thing. Yeah, because, because it looks like a train set. It looks like something out of Atlas Shrugged. It, it, it is our history. <laughs> it is manufacturing. But the thing is, yeah, it's old. And, my old buddy Chris Robbins, when we were looking at the railroad in Caldwell County, he said, "You, when you drive up 321A and you see all these mobile homes and junk and all this, you know, uh, uh, derelict cars and stuff, you put somebody on a train, they don't see any of that. They see that 200-year-old oak tree and that old church and that neat old manufacturing building. And so when you, well, my thought was, well, if you're in that holler building and you're looking at that lighted manufacturing building, 
To us, it looks like an old manufacturing building. But somebody coming from out of town looks at that and they say, wow, that is, that is cool looking. You could make it look neat. And it is our heritage. It is manufacturing. And it took a long time to build that, ma that manufacturing plant like that. And it produced a lot of jobs and a lot of product. And we ought to hold it up. That's my attitude about it. Yeah, but but, but like that's a right, right, I'm, 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 I'm going to stop you because another group coming in here. Yeah, we, we got uh, just a little bit more to go through, and uh, I thought she wasn't going to be here. <laughs> uh, okay, I, I, I just I just want to present this to you so so that you'll know that 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 Ted didn't pull any punches. Uh, leadership was another area that he he talked about, and one of the questions he asked the group was, "How do you get things changed? How do you get things done in Catawba County?" And the answer he got was just sort of like, silence like that. People, people did not know. People, that are in those people did not know how to get things changed. And, and Ted said he thought in the first group it was just the group, but then when it happened over and over and over and over again, he realized that was part of the issue. People didn't know how to get things changed. And when they asked, you know, in the past it was this strong family or something or other made a decision and did it. But this is one of the areas where he, he focused at that we need to work on developing leaders. This is not something that's going to change overnight. Okay? But some of the things in there was leadership training, especially taking some of the leaderships that we got, the young leadership, and start working with them to give them those leadership skills and getting them involved in different areas. Uh, so that was a punch in the face to our elected leadership. Okay? They took it hard. Uh, but, uh, like I said, he didn't pull any punches there. But it's not just elected leadership, you know, where are our no, no, he, he, he did not say elected leadership. Okay. I'm saying the elected leadership took it hard, okay? At least the ones that were in the room, okay? I'm not going to speak for the ones that weren't in the room, but the ones, okay? And, and I'm not going to get into that argument, but what I'm saying is he said that we need leadership and how to get things changed. And, and it, it starts with how do you build that leadership out of the community and not just in leadership now, but how do you build those leadership skills for the young folks that's coming up? Leaders emerge. They can emerge from anywhere. Exactly. The elected leaders, the elected leaders stakeholder group, when he asked that question, no one elected official named one of themselves. Wow. Yeah. So they don't think they're leaders. Yeah. So right here is the biggest point of the whole day is what happens February 5th when we approve this plan what leadership group or organization or, or group of people is going to implement this and run the match? Who's the champion? So, with that, I'm going to end today because Danny's got another group coming in here. But I, I want to challenge you folks. We've got a real issue with this group. And I want you to look around the table and tell me what it is. I'm negative. <laughs> yeah, Tom's negative. Okay, that's not the biggest issue. It's homogenous. <laughs> White males. All, all you have to do is use one word, diversity, okay? I want everybody back here in our February meeting, but I want you to bring somebody with you from a different demographic. Cool, I can do that. Okay? How do you mean that? Pardon me? How do you mean that? Diversity. Young people, ladies, immigrant communities. Uh, how is diversity going to solve our problem? Diversity may not solve our problem gets buy-in. But I think it will help in bringing new ideas, and if nothing else, it could bring more leadership to the table. And maybe more entrepreneurs. Maybe more entrepreneurs. I think that that's all fine and good. I, one of the problems that I've got is, is we're talking the same thing, and I hate to bring it out, but we're, we're talking the same thing. We talked over two years ago, and we've gone through all of this. And the point is, it's all good intentions, and we leave here saying, great, 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 and then nothing happens. But look what happened. Oh, no, wait a minute. I think a lot of proven a year, $50,000 because of this group. Now we've got a plan. Uh -huh. Now the most important part of this is right now, now what we're going to do. So we've got more, more to do in this room now than any, than any other time is maybe we don't focus so broadly and have conversations in such a realm. Maybe we find something in the plan that we take ownership of, whether that's leadership or whatever it is, and that. I, and I agree, and that's very positive. However, 
everybody who, who really is necessary to execute a plan like this has been here for a long time. There's, there's nobody new, unless we're going to be bringing some people in new that we don't that I don't know about uh, and training them and giving them the authority and responsibility to execute some of these things. What incentive does the people who run Hickory have to pay much attention to this, real attention to it? You would um, think it'd be I, obvious, I, wouldn't I you? Think, I think. I think really to to say that we are still talking about what we were two years ago is not an indictment. I think we'll be talking about it two years from now, in spite of a lot of progress, in spite of a lot of change. The important thing is that we are in dialogue and talking about it. I honestly believe that this group, as small as it is, and there are some missing here, is one of our most important groups in Hickory. There are lots of groups doing different things. But we are actually talking about, with disagreement, we've got disagreement among us, which is great. That is diversity. But I think if we're looking for the point in time when we say we have no more challenges and problems well, as a will. benchmark. That's correct. I know we never will. We won't. We, we simply won't. I'm proud of what this group has had, and I can name a bunch of things that are accomplishments and benchmarks of success. Yeah, and, a lot of them are down in, and a lot of them are down in the noise, and you have to think about them even though they're there. And, and I agree with all that. I absolutely agree with all that. You know, it's still, it's, it's the branding, it's the perception, it's the execution. It's who's responsible for doing it and if they're doing it right. You know, one of the things that, that you know, you can, in hindsight, you can look back and say the, our, our elected leaders never had contingency plans because they were so comfortable with the furniture manufacturer. They never thought it would go away. So, but when it went away, because they didn't have a contingency plan of what they would do next, they go, what do we do now? Well, there, yeah, that, but that's pointing fingers. I, I'd like to answer your question. Yeah. I'd like to see your question answered by who's going to do it. Yeah. And I think if every hand went up in this room, that would be accurate. And not everybody's in this room. Well, I think that's I, a I think our characterization of the area and may help you out, see if it works for you, is we're a very conservative area, very conservative. And conservative people tend to adapt to change very, very slowly, very slowly. They don't sit around and bitch and moan and carry about, on about stuff. They simply conform to it. And, and we don't, we're not activists. Uh, that's just not the way we work. Well, I, I, we, need to, he, we, we need to change that. He asked us to do something small right there, and a lot of times it's the small things. Let's see if it'll work. I'll bring a person here, and I think we all ought to make a pact to do what he asked us to do. Oh, okay. Your wife is a different demographic. Bring her in here. She's a very nice lady. But she bring doesn't her. like any kind of confrontation or trauma, and I'll embarrass the snot out of her. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll walk up to her and I'll. <laughs> but I'll bring some. The third Thursday, uh, the twenty-first, which is we're going to have to change. Yeah, we need to change that. A board meeting. We can do it uh, the twentieth Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I know there are mixed feelings about Hickory City government, but I, I, th I think that this life well crafted thing has been well conceived and well executed, and it's the kind of thing we need to be doing. I think it, it is. It, I think we have had our influence on that happening. And what are other people? I think that the life well crafted, art well, well crafted. Work, working with various towns, I mean, the town that's easy to store with, it's most, you know. I see the most movement is Conroe. I mean, I've given up on people. I mean, I, you don't think the well-crafted thing is... Oh, I do. I've got a sticker on my car. I think it's... <laughs> I think it's yeah, I do. I agree about Conroe. I do. I mean, but, and what's Conroe's... What's its source of energy? City manager. Well, mm -hmm. I understand a lot of times uh, uh, our conversations go all over the place, but I, I, I do think that we've had a lot of impact. Apparently, you know, a lot of Danny's chamber members think we've had a lot of impact. And we didn't have those 40 or 50 people in a room talking about this until after we pulled it together and said, where's the plan? Who is working on this? And so forth. Let me clarify. So, so I, I, I think we've had a lot of impact 
Don't get me wrong. I'm certainly not giving up. I mean, I, I'm, I'm here, and I will dedicate whatever time I possibly can to helping them where my skills are desired or whatever. You know, the, the, that's not the point. His point is how smart are we going to work? How are we going to incorporate other assets that we have or we should have, you know, to help us out so we don't have little pockets of people all kind of trying to do the same thing for their own little world when we should be working together to do it for the Catawba in, Valley area. In 2009, we had something like, you know, first we went down there to Raleigh to the Centennial Campus, and I can't remember what the event the next day was called, but that was virtually a TEDx event. Okay, and I would like to, to do that again, you know, and that was where you uh, had Donald Duncan got together with Dan St. Louis. That's how and, the solution said. Yeah, and wow. there were a lot of things that came out of that, and that was a 48-hour period. And think about, I mean, there were two years' worth of stuff that were developed in those two days. Let well, me, let me, I want to elaborate one I'd like second to do on, that. On, on Conover. It, it, Donald Duncan really has done a lot, but it was... Part of, part of it was his personality, but part of it was the fact that he got dropped in his lap, do something with his 27-acre Broyhill site. And he had he had to adapt to a, a impossible task. And he approached it from a creative way. And I'm telling you, it, it, he, he, had, he went to school. But does Hickory learn from what Donald did? Not to my, I'm, I have no awareness that Hickory has gone to Donald and said, how did you do that? Nothing's backed it into a corner. Yeah, yeah it doesn't, it, there's no asked? interaction. Uh, you were talking about yeah. that holler hosiery yeah. mill. Yeah. Did the holler hosiery having all those windows and, and the development of that, did that have anything to do with that facility, the Conover station down there? Because, no. well, the, the, the idea of having the windows, it's wide open like that is. And it is. Okay. I think, okay. I think, well, I think, I think, I think we're at a point, folks. We've got to do something. First of all, we've got to get out of the room. <laughs> but, the, but the other point I think I mean, is we've got we this competitive committee, and they're going to be assigning tasks out. And this this group has a lot of talent here. They can help with part of that. Who's going to be so, assigning tasks out? The Economic Competitiveness Planning Committee. The plan is approved February 5th. Ted will be back here at the Chamber's annual meeting on February 27th to present the plan for the first time out to the community. So, and from there, we'll be, we'll be adopting an implementation strategy between now and the 5th with the core group of us is who's going to manage this and, and help implement it. Now, is that, a, is that a, a chamber function or a county function, that, that committee that you're saying? The committee that you're saying is going to... It's just neither one. It, it is a endeavor that's got a lot of uh, local business in it and the county and the cities. So it's not reporting to anybody in particular? No. no I think it's, it's like mainly EDC. it's a chamber. It's not like uh, EDC or anything. It's, it's, they're it's they're a chamber back back initiative. Huh? Yeah, they're reporting back. 38 people, they're reporting back to the community what has been accomplished with Ted, and from there, a whole new leadership group will be put together to help him. Terry, thank you for your leadership. I've yes. watched you over the course of two years, and there's a fine balance between letting the dialogue run where it should be. <laughs> and there's a lot of Why are you looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> but you do a great this side of the table. I appreciate that. <laughs>